talk to the uh, Communities and Housing uh, Secretary of State, Robert Jenrick. Uh, Robert, very good to see you on what's been a very important day for you. Uh, you know, we've... Hi, good evening. We, we, we've got this tragedy of... Uh, many buildings still having this very dangerous cladding, the cladding that led to so many deaths uh, in the uh, Grenfell Tower conflagration. Um, what, for you, is the importance of 18 metres when it comes to giving full government compensation for the cost of replacing the cladding? I, I talk about 18 metres well, high, these buildings. That's right. Well, all the expert advice that I've received and my predecessors, going back to uh, Sajid Javid and, and Theresa May in the immediate aftermath of the fire, all the expert advisors say that height is the main driver of risk, risk of fires, risk of fatalities in those fires. And the 18 metres, the traditional definition of a high rise building, that's six storeys, is the best place to draw the line. And so the advisors have constantly said to us, focus government effort and resources on making sure that you get the dangerous cladding, the unsafe cladding, off those buildings. But, and so that's what we've done. But, Mr General, but, but hang on, but hang on. But, the, but, 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 but nobody the knows more... Of, but nobody knows more about fire risk than firefighters. The Fire Brigade Union has said again today that they see a significant risk of fire for buildings lower than 18 metres high. Why are you ignoring those experts? Well, those are experts. The government's, the, the, well, the government's principal advisor, uh, Dame Judith Hackett, who wrote the report into the regulatory regime after the Grenfell fire, she's in fact said this afternoon that she supports this approach. The risk of a fatal fire is four times higher in a building over 18 metres than those which are low or medium rise, traditionally defined as 11 to 18 metres. And so the expert opinion, the body of expert opinion, overwhelmingly supports the idea that you should focus effort on high-rise buildings. Actually, six storeys is not particularly high. It's not what most people would consider uh, a high-rise building in the sense of a tower block like the Grenfell Tower. And actually, in the immediate aftermath of the fire, many people are urged just to focus on buildings significantly taller than that. We're not saying that there isn't any remediation to be done in lower-rise buildings. Actually, we've been clear that there will be some instances far less likely, but some instances where you would want to remediate certain types of cladding. And so we have also provided support for those leaseholders as well. So for those over 18 metres, the government will step in if the building owners don't pay and we'll cover the whole of the cost. But for lower rise buildings, we're going to create a financing option where no leasehold will have to pay more than £50 a month. And I think that's a fair but no, but, it, but, it, but, but, but it wasn't the, the fault of those leaseholders that it turns out that through poor government regulation, you know, they've got cladding that needs to be removed. Why should those leaseholders, even in smaller buildings, have to pay anything? Well, the primary fault here is with the people who put the cladding on the buildings. This is about the industry, and we're ensuring that the industry do pay a fair contribution. We want them to be paying to remediate the building. But where that isn't happening, we're going to step in and we're going to help to recoup some of the money for the taxpayer by, for the first time, bringing in levies and taxes, uh, ta taxi taxes on those developers. So we will be making progress in that respect. But th the balance to be struck here is between the interests of the leaseholders and all of us have immense sympathy with them. And those are the broader taxpayer, of course, many of whom are not homeowners mm. at all. And what I'm proposing today is that the taxpayer pays over £5 billion pounds plus the financing scheme, which itself will no doubt cost hundreds of millions, if not billions of pounds. So somewhere between five and £10 billion pounds of taxpayer support to resolve this issue. And I think that most fair-minded people would think that that is a reasonable way forward, doing our best to support leaseholders, making sure that the industry pays its fair share, and, of course, putting in place a much more rigorous regulatory regime so this sort of thing never happens again. Uh, Secretary of State, I've got tons more I want to ask you, so please don't go away. Uh, and all of you at home, come back soon. We've got more to talk about, you know, the aftermath of the Grenfell tragedy, much more on COVID, uh, with Secretary of State Robert Janrick, uh, Nick Timothy and Liz Kendall. See you in a second. Hello, I'm delighted that the Housing and Community Secretary Robert Janrick is still with me. Um, we're talking... Uh, 
about this tragedy for many people of living in these buildings, which in some cases are actually almost unsellable because of the work they need to do to remove the cladding. Can I just ask you, on this uh, cheap loans that you're providing, where you say that the leaseholders would not pay, be paying you, say, more than £50 a month to, re to replace the cladding, do you have any sense of for how many years they might be paying that £50 a month? Well, we're going to set out more details soon, but the idea is that these are long tenure loans. They don't actually sit with the individual at all. They sit with the building, and so they don't have impact on someone's credit rating or your own personal finances. They're a bit like a ground rent, I'd describe them, and we're going to cap them at £50 a month. But, so but, but 600 quid, you've got to accept 600 quid. That is, that is a pretty affordable amount of money. Well, except 600 quid actually for many people a year is, 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 is a lot of money. And, you know, these are properties that have fallen but, but significantly if I, if I in value. That, that question. Yeah. The, the problem today is that in this group of, uh, of leaseholders who are in buildings 11 to 18 metres, they're very, very worried that they're going to have massive, unmanageable costs, you know, life changing bills. And so I think to go from that position to the certainty of knowing that the worst case scenario for you to get the cladding off your building would be a £50 a month charge is a huge step forward. That provides confidence and certainty to you as an individual, but it also means that your property uh, should be able to be sold. Lenders should feel more comfortable lending against it and all of the uh, big Retail banks have spoken to the Chancellor and I in the last few days and said that they strongly support this proposal and, of course, the £5 billion to get cladding off the high-rise buildings as well. So I think, although it's very early days, we will start to see a gradual recovery in this part of the housing market as a result of the big intervention that we've done today. I mean, there, there are still, you know, 80,000, maybe more than that, people who uh, are still desperately worried the values of their properties have, have, have collapsed. And they, I think they don't really understand why you've helped, you know, those in high-rise and, 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 and not them. Um, I would well, quite... I think, Robert, on that point, yeah. we have to follow the expert advice and we've got to take a proportionate risk-based approach. And... All of the experts say that 18 metres is yeah, the right you, you, approach. Okay, you've said below you have, you've, you have, you have, you have, you have it, said that already. Uh, it, is, I, it is just worth emphasising this point, if I may. Right. Below 18 metres, the risk is much lower. We'll work but the financial the cost is huge. But the we'll financial cost is many, huge many to people who will not require anything at all. No, but but the but the. The, the financial cost of any of these people, even at £50 a month, is still a, it's a lot of money. The value of their properties has fallen and they, they broadly take the view this is poor regulation, not their fault. But look, I, I, do need to, I do need to move on. One thing that people on a completely different issue don't really get, I think, is last year, uh, when we didn't have vaccines, we were allowed to go on summer holidays. This year, you know, we've got Grant Shouts, we've got the Prime Minister uh, today warning us that we may not be able to go on summer holidays, and yet we've got this massive vaccine programme. People don't understand what's going on. Well, I think we're just trying to be cautious. We all want to be optimistic. Of course, we'd love to go on holiday, whether that's within the UK or even abroad this summer, and I very much hope that that will be possible. But I think it's probably too early to make that judgment. It's much better to wait for a few more weeks to see how things are panning out. There's still a very large number of people in hospital with COVID. The number of people dying every day is still extremely high. Let's wait, get the data in. The Prime Minister, of course, in the week of the 22nd of February, will be setting out the roadmap for the months ahead. And I think it's probably at that point or shortly afterwards that we'll be able to give better advice to people and as can, to what their summer could look like. And can I just be clear, we've had three lockdowns already. If the scientists advise the Prime Minister that if he eases too soon, we're going to get a fourth lockdown, do you think the Prime Minister will be influenced by that? Well, the Prime Minister has been, I think, very clear that he doesn't want to see another national lockdown. We're going to take this slowly and in an incremental way and make sure that this is the last lockdown of its kind. And there's reason to believe that that will be possible because of the success of the vaccine programme. The roadmap that he'll set out will set out stage by stage how we can start to reopen the country, obviously beginning with the reopening of schools, which we very much hope to happen in early or, or mid-March. Uh, As a parent, I want to get my children back to, to school to face-to-face -to -face teaching. That's extremely important. That's likely to be the first step. 
but then others will follow in the weeks and months uh, beyond that. Yeah, months, I think, is what many people fear. Listen, very good to see you, Secretary of State. Come back soon. And now 